Do you want to turn up the speed on your 3D printer, but you don't know where to start? In this video, we're going to work through five steps to identify and manage limitations so you can unleash the beast. Over the last year or so, I've become much more interested in 3D printing at higher speeds, probably because I'm impatient. My patron Brandon requested a video on printing faster, so here we are. And we'll approach the idea systematically, as there is more to it than just turning up the feed rate. This is not a guide on slicer hacks and shortcuts, as I tried when doing the speed benchy challenge. I'll link to videos from Angus and Chuck if you want to learn more about that. Instead, it uses upgraded tests from my free calibration website, so you can properly understand limitations, address them and print faster. Before we go any further, there's something simple that we need to address because it's often overlooked, and that is checking safety limits in the firmware. Just because we come into our slicer and we increase the feed rate, doesn't mean that feed rate will be achieved when we print. And that's because there are safety limits present in each firmware. If you try to exceed them, the printer probably won't say anything, but the speed will be capped. These limits are important in case we slip when we're setting up our slicer profile. These firmware limits will protect the machine from tearing itself to bits by keeping the feed rate within reasonable boundaries. On the speed and max flow tuning page of my calibration website, I've updated the instructions to serve as a guide for Marlin Clipper and RepRap on how you can check what your currently set limits are so you don't end up scratching your head later on. Next up, we have hot end flow rate, which is probably the most important limitation to understand. This is a 3D Benchy. And this is another 3D Benchy, but let's say it was printed in half the time. Assuming the mass is the same, and therefore the volume of plastic, that means it had to have been flowing twice as fast for the Benchy on the right. Anytime we up our printing speed, it means we're extruding the plastic in less time, and therefore our flow rate requirements are higher. Therefore, I think the best approach in printing fast is to test out the maximum volumetric flow rate of your hot end, and once we know that, we can calculate the fastest feed rates we can use before extrusion will break down. Fortunately, there's a number of ways we can measure our maximum flow rate, including this very simple test on my website where we extrude filament in free air at faster and faster feed rates until we start to get skips, in which case we know we're hitting our limit. For a more exact method, Stefan from CNC Kitchen recently produced a video explaining his new hot end flow benchmarking tool which creates a series of filament blobs to fill your plate, but at different temperatures and speeds, you can then weigh these to find out which ones are under extruded and therefore calculate your max volumetric flow. Or yet another option, this one being more visual in the assessment, I've updated the speed tuning test on my free website to also be a max flow test. This test will generate G-code for your 3D printer in the form of an odd shape printed in vase mode. For each vertical segment, you can set the exact feed rate that you want for the single outer perimeter. The idea is that you increase the speed for each segment, and as it rises, eventually the hot end flow won't be able to keep up, and you'll start to get under extrusion, in which case you should stop the print to prevent any jams or blockages. This test was already on the website, but what I've now added is an extra column to tell you the calculated volumetric flow. This is set by the nozzle width and layer height, and as you change the perimeter feed rate, you'll see that the volumetric flow for that section updates in real time. To calculate the maximum volumetric flow, you simply print the G-code as before. And if you reach a speed in which the extrusion breaks down, in my case the third segment, with this knowledge we come back to the website and our max flow is right there. I could reliably print at 70mm per second, which with this extrusion width and layer height, is a volumetric flow of around 20 millimeters cubed per second. If I wanted a more exact value, I can come back and rerun the test with much closer values. So now we know our maximum volumetric flow rate, but what do we do with it? What we do next depends on our slicer, and if you're using Prusa Slicer, you can come to the speed tab, and assuming you have the expert setting showing, you'll see a setting for max volumetric speed. The same goes for my favorite Super Slicer, where this setting is found in the same place, but instead is called volumetric speed for auto speed, different name, same function. To see how this works, let's start by having it at zero, which means it's turned off. In this example, I'm using a 0.6 millimeter nozzle with a 0.4 millimeter layer height. And you can see most of my feed rates are set at 80 millimeters per second, which I know from my speed test tower, is gonna be too much for the hot end to handle. 
I've sliced apart. I'm going to change the preview to volumetric flow rate. And then I'm going to look inside the G code. We can see that some portions are in the orange and that's going to put us over the 20 millimeters cubed per second that we know our hot end can flow. So now we come back and let's put in a safe value of say 18 millimeters cubed per second. The first thing we notice is that our maximum volumetric flow rate has been capped at our value of 18. And if we look through our G-code preview, we can see that the flow rate never exceeds this. Switching to the speed preview, we can see the slicer has changed the speed to ensure that we never exceed our maximum flow and to keep the extrusion reliable. Pretty neat, but what about other slicers? For everything else, I've added a reverse calculator to the bottom of the page. To use it, we need three values. And by clicking on our slicer, we'll be told where to get them. We need our layer height, our extrusion width, and then we enter our volumetric flow that we determined from the test. And for this combination, the calculator tells me that in the slicer, I can use a value of up to 250 millimeters per second. Nothing will be automatic like Prusa and Super Slicer, but at least I have an upper limit that I can work towards. It's pretty clear that our max flow rate is the ultimate limitation in terms of printing fast. So beyond spending money to upgrade hardware, how can we improve it? This one is simple. Any hot end can flow more filament if we turn up the hot end temperature. At this point, we can measure the increased flow by rerunning the test. Just keep in mind that increasing the hot end temperature will make the filament more oozy and increase stringing. Print quality can also deteriorate in other ways which we'll discuss later, so we need to find a compromise that works. Through our testing, we now have a ceiling for our feed rate, but that doesn't mean we can simply up the speeds to match. The next thing we need to understand is the relationship between speed and acceleration on print time. Too often people think the key to printing fast is simply upping the feed rate in the slicer. To illustrate this, here's some footage of a 3D Benchy printing at 200 millimeters per second feed rate. And you might be thinking that just doesn't look fast enough. Here is another 3D Benchy also printing at 200 millimeters per second feed rate. And as you might expect, this one looks like things are moving a lot faster. The thing here is that these two Benchies are running exactly the same G code. The one on the left running the typical factory acceleration value of 500 and the one on the right, the more extreme 10,000, which gives a 45 minute reduction in print time. To demonstrate the importance of acceleration, we've come to the Prusa calculator page and we're scrolling to the bottom. Let's enter that same feed rate of 200 millimeters per second and that typical acceleration of 500. We can see from the graph that we accelerate up to speed, maintain it where the blue line is and then decelerate at the end. But this is over a pretty long distance, whereas a 3D Benchy is only around 30 millimeters or so long. And as the graph shows, there's no blue line Therefore, we're accelerating and then decelerating without ever hitting top speed. So for a small print like this, to actually save time, we need to keep up in the acceleration until the blue line appears. Fortunately, printing faster won't require the crazy acceleration values you see on world record speed benchy attempts. But the point I'm trying to make is, don't just up the feed rate in the slicer and think that you're printing faster, because if you ignore acceleration, the effect will be minimal. Also remember that increasing acceleration will reduce print time, so our hot end is passing filament at a higher rate. A big increase in acceleration may cause our extrusion to break down, so you might need to rerun the max flow test using the higher acceleration values for an accurate result. Trust me, there's a lot of speed to be found with higher speed and especially acceleration. But how fast is too fast? This brings us onto our fourth topic, mechanical artifacts affecting print quality. Just because we know how fast we can print in terms of hot end flow, there's no guarantee the rest of the 3D printer can cope with this aggressive movement. As we up the feed rate, but especially as we up acceleration, our machine is going to have a much harder time mechanically. The most common way we'll see this in the final print is through an artifact known as ringing or ghosting, where the features of the model are repeated across the surface due to printed components vibrating. A more serious consequence are layer shifts, Typically they happen, as you see here, when the nozzle catches the model, but they can also happen if your acceleration values are too high and your stepper motors can't cope with the inertia that comes with changing direction at very high speed. Different kinematic systems will be more or less susceptible to ringing than others. For instance, Core XY and Delta printers typically have less mass to shift around compared to the heavy bed of an i3. So how much acceleration is too much? Fortunately, I have another free test that can help you determine this for your printer. I already had this test on my website and it works for Marlin, catering for both jerk and junction deviation. 
but if we scroll up, we can see that it now officially supports Clipper with the acceleration and square corner velocity and RepRap firmware with maximum instantaneous speed change. I'd recommend using feed rates that you determine to be safe from the flow test with the outer perimeter feed rate slightly lowered, replicating what's found in most slicer profiles. You can then up the acceleration for each segment and use the print result to determine the level of acceleration that has the best compromise of speed and ringing for your needs. Underneath the test, there's a section on how to interpret your results, as well as a new section that tells you how to store them for Marlin Clipper and RepRap. After finding a nice acceleration value, I would suggest you lock this in for each segment and then experiment with the second parameter, such as jerk or square corner velocity. Depending on your firmware, raising acceleration doesn't have to compromise print quality, as this test shows where the extrusion becomes more consistent as the acceleration goes up. The reason for this is also at the bottom of the page in the form of input shaping, where control of the stepper motor is altered to cancel out vibrations. Clipper currently has the most powerful input shaping with the ability to specify different frequencies and types for X and Y, whereas WebRap firmware is currently limited to the same frequency for X and Y. Input shaping really is amazing and I can't recommend it enough. Just one more factor that people often forget and it catches them out. When printing fast, this is often forgotten, but very important, and that is part cooling. Cooling the stepper drivers is also important when printing fast, but most printers already have active cooling in place for this, so it won't necessarily catch you out. What most people don't realize is that when you're printing fast, there's no such thing as too much part cooling. All filament is extruded in a molten state, but for runny filaments like PLA, we need them cooled almost instantly to hold their shape. The faster we print, the less time the part cooling fan has to blow on the object. And that means new filament is being deposited on top of filament which is still hot and soft. For filaments that need cooling, you'll notice that the quality drops as your speeds and acceleration increase. And you'll find that upgrading the part cooling system will give you an immediate boost in surface quality when printing fast with filaments like PLA. Hopefully your part cooling is strong enough that you can turn it down for general printing but have it spin up to full speed when you have a short layer or perhaps a bridge or overhang. There's no reason you can't combine the processes from this video with the slicer hacks. For example, why not go beyond your max volumetric flow rate for internal infill, as this will never be seen, so if it's slightly under extruded, it shouldn't matter at all. Travel feed rate and acceleration can also be increased, as once again, this won't be seen in the final object. Hopefully this guide is useful, especially the additions to my calibration website. That reverse calculator can be used to compare the speeds possible with different layer heights and widths too. Thank you for watching this far, and until next time, happy fast 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe, and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.